Now, of course, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country, and we acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of this, of this land and pay respect to the elders past and present. Now, you are in for a treat. Um, my name's Pamela James, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Dixon Room today for this, for this session on both an unlikely and a likely marriage of art, crime and literature. But some housekeeping notes first, if you wouldn't mind muting your phones. Um, and I've just realised I haven't done mine, I'll do it in a minute. Um, now, they've asked that you don't film um, this session on your phones, but any, um, the odd snapshot you're happy to, we're happy if you share that on the hashtag of Bad Crime Sydney. So, the way this is going to roll is that we'll have a discussion, no, a conversation, um, and then with 10 minutes to go, um, we'll have questions. So, let me just turn off my phone. Thank you. I'm now in control. This is, <laughs> this is how not to do it 101. So, let me begin with my um, unusual position in this, and that I'm probably the only person in this room that is not a writer. However, my expertise is in art crime and before that in museology and art history. So I come at this very much as a hard-nosed um, person. But when these works were sent to me and when I was asked if I'd like to moderate this session this morning and I read the books, and I, I started thinking about the way in which art crime has become such a popular ingredient in um, criminal art literature on crime in all sorts of ways. Last night I was watching for the first time and by accident a program, um, a series, TV series called Murder in Provence. And within, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but within about two minutes, they kept referring to this glass, this glassware that this shonky, not that professors are ever shonky, but this one was. And his shonkiness was to do with um, having a business in a scholarly way, authenticating um, Baroque, or Art Nouveau, sorry, um, glassware. Um, but in fact, it, it was, they were all frauds, but he was using his, his position to, as an expert to authenticate them as... as as being real when in fact they weren't. And I went from there thinking, you know, okay, that was obvious in the first five minutes to me where this story was going to go. And then I looked across at my husband who was ignoring the television and reading the latest Daniel Silver. <laughs> and then I thought about um, my two and a half minutes of fame in my lunchbox, which was to do with the very recent SBS documentary called The Mission, which is about an art heist in New Norcia in in Western Australia and, and what happened with the lovely Mark Fennell and Corin Grant. So it's, it's all around us, you know, it's all around us as a criminal enterprise, but also one in which for these three writers has provided the most intriguing, fascinating and unshakable hook. So, We've got some, dis uh, some discussion questions which um, we've agreed between the four of us. Actually, I'm not sure you agreed, John. I did. Did you? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to begin with is, is actually excluding Mark for the moment and asking Alexandra and John about the ways in which you looked at art crime as a hook for your books as a hook for my book, <laughs> although I have written a number of other books. This is the one that The Artist's Secret is the name of the book and its story swirls around 
a complex art crime. I'm very passionate about the world of art and when you write historical fiction, you necessarily have to spend a lot of time researching, detailing, I call it set and forget, and then you can delve into your story. So I wanted to write about an area that I was passionate about if I was going to sit with it for that amount of time. I wanted to write about the 80s as opposed to the 60s because I was really interested in such a short space of time in the 60s that was love, peace and anti-materialism and the 80s was all about greed is good. And that really propelled me to the art world because art in the 1980s was the absolute trophy for multimillionaires. And I was drawn to Manhattan because that was the centre of the lords of industry and of this seething art market. Alan Bond had bought the world's most expensive painting, which was Van Gogh's Irises in 1987 for $54 million without actually ever paying a cent. I may en enlarge upon that later. As most of you probably know, he ended up in prison after a number of frauds and spent his time painting still lifes and portraits, which is sort of ironic. So I set my book the year afterwards, um, 1988, when the art market was at its peak, particularly for Impressionist and Post-Impressionist works. I used the particular painting uh, that I selected because the heart of the story goes to a young woman seeking a sister she never had. And this particular painting shows two young girls playing at a piano. And you can sense from it, it's a famous Renoir, the passion of their relationship. So the 80s was about passion, desire, but it was also about greed and anguish. And I chose this particular painting, Two Girls at a, at a Piano, because there is a number of versions of it already in existence. So, I love the idea of the 80s and art being a trophy, because it obviously very much was. The trophy, the word trophy, goes to a whole new level when you think about the Isabella Gardner. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's a trophy, uh, trophies, that I don't think has been matched apart from uh, Hitler. And it's an engrossing crime because... Oh, it's, sorry. It's an engrossing crime because it's... The only crime I can think, the only art crime I can think of where after all this time there has not been one whisper, no one has broken that code of silence. And of course the terror is the longer it goes on, the kind of framework of those people who know where bits of that plot are, are dying or being murdered and the chances of finding it are remote. We've got here in the audience one of the, probably somebody who knows more about it than most people in the world. Um, so, art crime, the yeah. Isabella Gardner and Van Gogh. Okay. So, um, the books I've written prior to this one, which is called Framed, were really uh, crime, espionage, cyber thrillers and so on. Uh, but I'm an art lover, like my colleagues here, and my wife is a sculptor, and so we're always visiting museums, wherever we travel, enjoying the works. And there were two, there were two, two events that uh, were like a revelation for me. And one of them was, I can kind of explain with this. So some years ago, um, Jenny and I were at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. And we'd been told to go there by a friend who said it's a pretty amazing museum. 
It was created by this woman, Isabella Stewart Gardner, in the early 1900s and left as a bequest to the city on condition that not one work mm. could be Changed. moved, sold, mm. no works bought, etc. And she built this extraordinary uh, copy of a 15th century Italianate mansion in the swamps, then As swamps, of Boston. She was very wealthy. And when we went to visit, we go into a room and there are a bunch of frames like this, bigger frames than this, some the same size. And we're kind of shocked by this, what happened. And we discovered that in 1990, in the dead of night, on St. Patrick's Day weekend, uh, two men dressed as police turned up at the museum and knocked on the door and were let in. And then they tied up the night watchman and said, this is a robbery, which is the name of a Netflix series about this robbery. And they stole 13 works, including three Rembrandts, five by Degas, an extraordinary painting by Vermeer. Vermeer. Um, and by the way, uh, Isabella uh, bought the Vermeer, which is called The Concert, it's a beautiful, beautiful painting, at an auction and outbid the Louvre for it. Uh, and this is one of only 34 Vermeers that kind of still exist, we hope it still exists. So one of the things that I walked away with from that was what happened to the paintings? Because as Pamela said, there's never been a whisper, there's never been discovered, and at the time, the paintings were worth 200 million US dollars. Today, their estimated value is a billion mm. US dollars, and no one knew where they went. And I thought, maybe a hero in one of my novels could discover where they were, and I thought, wouldn't it be good if they landed up in Woolloomooloo? And so that was the first kind of uh, so element. The frame. And you can see that, you know, we've kind of copied that idea. The second was um, in 2013, an English art journalist discovered in a Japanese museum when he was um, uh, looking in some drawers for old prints, he discovered the print of a magnificent Van Gogh sunflowers that was believed to be destroyed in World War II. So take yourself back to the day when the Allies bombed Hiroshima. The night before, they bombed Kyoto. And a very, very wealthy Japanese trader owned six sunflowers. And let me just show you this. This is six sunflowers. And of all of the sunflower paintings that Van Gogh did in Arles in France, which he made, as many of you will know, as a kind of a welcome to Paul Gauguin, who was coming to stay in the Yellow House with him. It was to brighten up his room. This one apparently went up in smoke with the house when the Allies bombed. And I thought, but what if it didn't? Mm -hmm. What if, in the dead of night, um, the, uh, the particular trader who owed money to the Yakuza um, they came and took it. And then you say, what happened with them? And as um, we were discussing earlier, and as you'll see in um, Alexandra's fantastic book as well, uh, the vast majority, we all think that stolen art, big stolen art like this, uh, is, is landed up on some rich person's wall. And the truth is quite different. That may happen occasionally, like in the Thomas Crown Affair or Murray something Farquhar. like that. Or Mary Farquhar, I don't know about that one, but there you are. Um, but the majority of them are used by criminals as collateral to fund their illicit operations or as a kind of a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, uh, a chip, a bargaining chip. Yeah, yeah. If they get arrested for yeah. something, they say, we will disclose, we will give back this extraordinary painting mm. if we get a lesser sentence or you let us off the hook. So that's what kind of infused this. Mm. Uh, and I thought, th I really want to know what happened to these paintings. And then you have to kind of go into a whole lot of research about art crime, what happens, where it could be, and all the speculation in relation to all of these works. And then I had to be 
a conservator at the Art Gallery of New South Wales because my hero is a young conservator who finds mm. them and she has to prove that they're genuine because you wouldn't expect to find them in Wollongaloo, would you? Close. And, and so they, they were very, very helpful, the Art Gallery here and the Van Gogh Museum in, um, in Amsterdam. So, John and Alexandra, both, you know, this is a world that once you put your toe in it, it's impossible to extricate your whole body. Because you just sh even with this, the mission, you know, you shake... I kept spent this whole time, they were filming, going, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? They didn't. How do you... you know, what? It's this world of... It goes from the most ghastly kind of criminal enterprises and cruelty to, you know, these the three guys that did the theft in the mission who were just complete morons, you know, they were like... It was like Keystone Cops. Um, but, Mark, in your book... Picasso Ransom, it's a very much more, it's a very hard-nosed empirical survey of almost, you know, crimes I've known, art crimes. This is with a particular Australian emphasis. And it was, a, I loved it. It was a fantastic book to dip in and dip out of and go, oh, okay, yeah, well, I'm, I didn't know about that one. So how do you respond to what Alexandra and John have said about art crime and the plethora of ways in which it occurs and then why in literature? And why in literature? Um, that's a big question. Okay. You've got five minutes. Right. It's fine. Um, firstly, I'd read about the Gardner Museum theft uh, and I'd read about um, other major art crimes, forgeries, etc. Um, and as a art critic and art writer in Melbourne, I'd also come across some of these, like the Liberto forgeries of Rover Thomas, and I thought, well, there's really might even be enough stories just about Melbourne for a book, but actually I wanted to have it about Australia. Um, once I discovered that there were some extraordinary stories that really hadn't been told since they were first reported, and it was... I just wanted to tell some different stories and Australia became a, a good little geographical survey because it's not the centre of the art world but there are a lot of forgeries, there are particularly of indigenous art. There's a, um, of course everybody, most people knows about the Picasso ransom in Melbourne where the weeping woman was stolen back in 1986 from the NGV. But what really hooked me in there was, you know, I was a uni student in Melbourne at the time, um, but what I didn't know was the number of Picassos that had been taken without permission uh, from other art galleries in Australia. There is one in the Queensland Art Gallery which was also taken without permission. Um, and I, yeah, was just became amazed at the variety of crimes and also wanted to look at other crimes that weren't just the forgeries and art thefts because there's also vandalism, there's artists who get in trouble for what they actually put on making the art. Um, desecration of the flag is not illegal in Australia but uh, various policemen do believe that it should be. Um, also, degrees of obscenity aren't actually illegal in Australia, although some people have been convicted of it um, for their art. Uh, and then there's vandalism. And um, the few years ago with the Black Lives Matter movement, when there was talk about statues being removed, I was just sitting there going, you people don't know how many statues are stolen each year. Because this, this bronze is 90% copper. And copper is, very is becoming very, very valuable uh, in, for building and electronics, etc. And so you can just sell scrap copper. And the price has gone up um, about five times mm. uh, its value back in the 90s. And so all of a sudden, ripping off public sculpture from the street um, became a 
enterprise for really low-level thieves. It was very popular in England. In fact, one of the two greatest sculptors, modernist sculptors, Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth, you know, ma huge works mm. were just disappearing from parks overnight. Yeah. And I remember once um, when I was dealing with um, a lovely, lovely bloke, a policeman who was head of the larceny squad at New South Wales. He was a really nice bloke, but I had to work very, very hard to get him off the subject of copper theft in art <laughs> because he kept saying, but that's where the money is. Like, no, 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 no. So what, if, you, if somebody was, um, you know, as we are here, and I dare say when it comes to question time, If you were put on the spot and asked, what do you believe is most often the reason for art being stolen, not mutilated, mm. that's another whole box and dice? Um, well, there are, there are two types. There's the professional criminals. Um, and then there's the, of course, then there's the criminals who think that they're professionals but aren't actually professional. And then there's the people who are stealing it for entirely different reasons. And these might include professional criminals. Uh, Stephen Sellers stole um, from the John Joseph Brown collection in Melbourne. He stole all their best mm. works in the 70s in an overnight raid on New Year's Eve. It's huge. Huge theft. And then he held them for ransom for getting better, getting better treatment for prisoners in maximum security. That was his really big issue. Um, and fortunately, uh, he and was spent a Friday night in King's Cross and got arrested with the location of the uh, warehouse where he was storing all the paintings in his pocket. Oh, God. So, so one of the things that... Uh, so in my work over the past 25 years, my work has been mainly to do with policing with working with um, both local, this New South Wales police, um, federal police, but also international policing bodies like the FBI, Interpol, the Carabinieri in Italy who are lucky enough to have 300 specialised art and culture and heritage protection police. In Australia we have none. Um, the police tend to be only interested in the artwork that has very large dollar signs in front of it. Yeah. The, when the Laughing Cavalier, I should, again, I'm throw, I should be throwing to the audience but for this, but when the Laughing Cavalier was stolen um, from the Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, neither the artwork nor the perpetrators were found. But interestingly, the Treasury, the State Treasury, was obviously a bit disappointed with the police investigation. They hired their own in private investigator who, and I'll cut all this short because it may come up in a question, I hope, is that um, the private investigator said to the local police at the Rocks who were in charge of the investigation... Meanwhile, I should t preface this by saying the outgate took them three days to let the police know that this work had disappeared from the wall... Um, there was a really good lead, this private investigator thought, that this work was still in Australia. But unfortunately for us, um, that policeman's daughters were playing in a netball final that weekend. Was it netball or basketball? Anyway, and so the policeman couldn't follow up that lead. So, you know, we, we deal with... We deal with whole... Um, Police departments like the FBI, mm. stolen art, um, stolen art um, group that are the most sophisticated of any in the world because they believe the figures are very dodgy about this. They've, it's very hard to put a figure on exactly what the dollar value of art crime is a year. I mean, for a long time, Interpol was saying that it is amongst the top three criminal enterprises. Top three. Now think of that. People smuggling, arms dealing, drugs, an art crime is up there simply because of the dollar value that's associated with it. So when it comes to countries like Australia, it's really tough. And I remember sitting with a then Assistant Commissioner of Police. This is before the wonderful Nick Caldos. 
and et al, who was fantastic. And he sat there and I was trying to talk him into looking at a, a database, a very quick, easily established database um, in Australia. And he looked at me and he said, rich people buy art, rich people can afford to lose it. And that was a long time ago and yet I still meet it almost every day. So what, for me, what these books do is actually a lot more than tell a story, even though the stories are bloody good. It's actually important that this criminal enterprise is, is out there. And in Australia, I should say, the warning signs around Indigenous art are almost beyond out of control, I think. So, when you're writing something like this, you've both, you've all talked about research. And when I looked at Mark's book, that's a, a, a great whack of primary research evident at the back, and it's absolutely implicit through both your works. In, in both Alexandra's work and, and John's work, the characters, the leading protagonists, if you like, are two women um, who are in the museum industry. So they have this wonderful platform to be both informed and uh, made aware of the dodginess of what I've always called the art game. So how important for the three of you is research? John first. Um, well, more than important, it's fun. And, it fun. you know, I love doing it. And, you know, you start uh, with an idea and then start going down lots and lots of wonderful rabbit holes. But then when you kind of crystallise the idea into a story, you've got to work out, gosh, there's a whole lot of uh, stuff I need to know that I don't know. Often at writers' festivals and when writers are starting off, publishers and other writers will say, write what you know. And um, I think that's a bit of a boring way to be a writer. Because if you write what you know, in my case, it would be about investment banking or law or company boards or something like that, and no one would really give a damn about True. that. True. So my view is you write about what you're passionate about and what you're really interested in. And if you've got half a brain, you can find out virtually everything that you need to know. And people are so helpful. Um, I found this through six books. You know, whenever I've needed to know how to blow up a nuclear power station. So I, I got uh, engineers, nuclear physicists, to kind of help me. That's without, without disclosing it, I needed to know what would happen so that it would give um, credibility to the story without the method. In this case, um, I approached the art gallery here uh, and got a lot of help from them. I approached the Gardner Museum and I approached the Van Gogh Museum and I got an enormous amount of help. And then, um, you know, you do your own research apart from that and then at the end what I did, <coughs> pardon me, was all the relevant chapters that had to do with proving whether these works were genuine or not, uh, I had them review them to make sure that I hadn't made any mistakes. And what was interesting for me about that was something that I'd been told by one of the museums. When I showed it to the other museum, they said, no, no, that's a common misconception. <laughs> They're totally, utterly wrong. You know, that particular kind of blue was never used by... Um, by Van Gogh, you know, you can't have that there. That would be terrible, you know, that would be a crime against humanity almost. So um, the research is crucial, but for me, it is just great fun. Mm. He here. Um, it is great fun. And in my book, uh, the protagonist starts off her life as a curator at a gallery very similar to the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and I was very lucky because I had a friend who was a curator at that time, was able to give me the lowdown. 
um, although there is a disclaimer at the back of the book, just in case the dreadful <laughs> things that occur in this art museum are actually placed at the art gallery's door. But she is forced to take a job on the dark side, which is in a major auction house in New York. Um, I call it Arches and I call it the Holy Trinity because it's up there with Sotheby's and Christie's. I had attended auctions. I'd even bought one or two things at auctions, but I didn't know anything about the auction business. So I decided I would pick out a number of leading auctioneers who had actually worked in big overseas international houses during the 80s and interview them, which was a great idea other than for COVID <laughs> because it meant that I couldn't do face-to-face -face interviews and in some cases um, one person got stuck in Palm Beach during the Peninsula lockdown and one person got stuck in Melbourne during their lockdown. And the thing is, I don't know how you two have found it, but people are very unlikely to divulge secrets over Zoom. You've got to get up close and personal. So it's only over a cup of coffee or indeed a glass of wine that things begin to get a little looser. Um, so that eventually it was a very hit and miss, but eventually I was able to line up these interviews and learnt an enormous amount about the auction industry, um, of which I was completely ignorant. Um, one of the best things that came out of that, this is really taking uh, one's primary research to the next level, was I needed to write a scene in the book where bidding is taking place and my main character is on the end of a telephone taking bids. As luck would have it, one of the auctioneers said to me, we're doing an enormous auction up here in Sydney and due to COVID and the flu and whatever, you know, the, we don't have enough people to take the telephone bids. Do you know anyone who could do it? I, of course, said, oh, I'd love to do it. I thought I was an expert in the auction business. I soon learned that what I had acquired was theory and not practice. Because one thing you're not prepared for is auctions go like the wind. And there's an old maxim in the uh, auctioneer, the art auctioneering industry. It's not like a home where you've only got one property. You know, you might have 60 works to get through in an hour. So the maxim the maxim is give them just enough time to put their hand up, but not long enough to think about it. <laughs> so when you're on the end of the phone, what I also hadn't realised was how noisy it was going to be because you've got other people taking phone bids to the left, other people on the right. The auctioneer is calling out. There's bids coming from the room and it's all going at the speed of light. Um, I teetered perilously close to disaster. Um, things started to go wrong when I, you never introduce yourself because you don't have enough time. You say, is John there? Or whoever it happens to be. I said, is Olive there? And got a no. Phone went down. Oh God, I look at the sheet. It's not Olive, it's Clive. Mm. Oh. O and C. Um, so at the end of the, it was the most exhilarating but terrifying experience. Um, at the end, the auctioneer was kind enough to say, that went quite well. Would, would you like to do this from time to time? I decided it would be much wiser to quit while I was ahead and put all of that experience, because something does go disastrously wrong for my character when she's taking mm. a telephone bid straight into the book. And I, I like to think that when people read it, they can really feel that electricity in the auction room and they get this understanding of what's driving it forward. And you certainly can. Um, those um, sections of the book that are in that world, directly in that world, you realise how 
what a, a tenuous place it is, you know, for both legitimate works and works that are not. It's very easy for one to become the other and vice versa without the auctioneer um, realising that. And, of course, the disaster for my character is that she auctions this key painting only to find that she has auctioned a fake. Mm. Or has she? Mm. And, it, you know, in the real world, that is such, you know, there by the grace of God, you just look at it and you think, you know, it depends on the both the calibre of the auction house in terms of people with an eye looking but also with enough knowledge to actually be able to call it for fake and assurance to be able to call it for fake if they think it is. What do you think, Mark, about re research? Oh, well, I did a lot of research. Um, I went through Trove um, to discover most of these old newspaper articles. So some of the stories haven't been told since they were re first reported in newspapers. The uh, first forgery story in the book is about some Sydney antique dealers who were turn of the century uh, making fake miniatures of Captain Cook and uh, other um, uh, prominent Australian explorers and they're trying to sell them to actually the library here um, for their collection and uh, it all goes wrong but uh, in the story of forgeries, no conviction because mm. the jury couldn't decide who was a conspirator and who was a, a victim in this whole fraud. Um, but yeah, I went through Trove and searched for things like stolen painting. Now that will turn up stolen paintbrushes, stolen paint, um, but yeah, I just went through it page after page, you know, stolen sculpture, um, forged, vandalized sculpture, all of these um, basic little search terms. And then when I found a story, sometimes it would be, of course, it would just be fragments from a newspaper report and you'd have to trace back. And like, there was a stolen Bronzino Renaissance in, uh, painting in uh, Sydney back in the 1940s. And I'm thinking, this doesn't sound right. And then I read about that the police had arrested the guy and he had another stolen painting and 14 guns, handguns. Then when I came to the court scene and his lawyer explaining, now this is an antique 14 inch Turkish pistol. Mm, I don't think he's a criminal now. I think he's a genuine antique dealer. Um, and so yes, as you read, as I read these stories, I would be piecing them together and sometimes, you know, going off and thinking one way and then discovering that actually, yeah, it was a completely different story. Um, or that, you know, someone I thought was obviously guilty was in fact innocent um, in some of the art thefts. Um, or well, you've only got to look at the Gant and, see, you know, the recent Melbourne case with the Brett Whiteleys to see that the oh, still the judicial um, yeah. uh, concern over art yes. compared to blood spatter and, and DNA is very problematic. Yes, well that's one of, that was when I got into, well I'd already attended the Paul Yor um, child pornography accusation trial. Um, no, he did not create child pornography, sticking magazine pictures together along with various assorted stuff. You're never going to create child pornography, I mean he never had any interaction with children, so mm -hmm. it was kind of a, a moot point. But as an art writer, I then got the courtroom experience of doing that, and then I went back for the uh, Peter Gant, Eamon Sadiq, Brett mm -hmm. Whiteley forgery trial, and sat through most of that. I didn't quite get it all, but I was able to read court transcripts of the days I couldn't make. Mm. Um, so that was another side of research and then of course there's the side of research which is just talking to people involved um, and some of that went very well. Uh, I was able to track down a guy who'd taken a Picasso in from the uh, Queensland Art Gallery and he was a very informative and happy witness to uh, explain exactly what went on there. Uh, my dealings with the Libertos who were forging indigenous art did not go so well, but I really didn't care. 
um, and we ended up just exchanging insults and still do occasionally on social media. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Um, so it's warts and all, really. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that... Because um, I want to ask the three of you now about why you think art crime has become such a popular motif, if you like, um, in literature and, and in movies. And I was casting my eye over, over my bookshelf and I think I counted something like, something like 140 books um, that are focused on or to do with or, or police reporting about art crime. And, and it's, a, it's a fairly new... Uh, genre or fairly new incursion into the much loved genre of crime writing. And so the question is why art? Why art? Why art, which is held simultaneously as one of the highest achievements of human culture and markers of civilization and marker of culture, marker of class, you know, da da da, at the same time it is at the epicentre of crimes like the Isabella Gardner, like the Caravaggio. I mean, look, you know, da 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 da, you, you go on and on. Why do you think art is so, why art has become such a popular hook? Because it certainly is a hook. It's John? A hook. I think it starts with crime being a popular hook. Um, okay. You know, this, this festival. Uh, at bad is is all about crime, and crime is one of the biggest selling, um, you know, fiction movies, etc. Because we love to know about criminals and all of the things that they do and what they're stealing. But why art crime? I think because it makes crime tangible and safe. It's for us. Well, maybe safe, but I think it's tangible. So. If I'm going to rob a bank, it's a bank, you know. Do we care about banks? Yeah, no. But we care about really beautiful, expensive works that are beyond any of our right. re reach, yeah. right? And so why you have these, um, they're really kind of glorifying the art world as well as crime. And I think we're all sucked into that uh, in so many ways. You know, it's why we go to the big art museums to see these works. We would love to have those works in our lives, but we can't because we can't pay, you know, $100 million for a Van Gogh. Mm. Um, so I think it has to do with the, the making of crime very tangible, relating it to something that all of us love, which is art, uh, and also the cost. Alexandra. There are numerous types of art crime. Um, art crime can be theft, but it can also be forgery. Mm. And it can also be looting, which has happened, um, which is in the news all the time now, you know, from the Pergamon marbles on. And most recently it can be vandalism. Sometimes um, for a political stance, sometimes just because of a destructive tendency. So there is a wide area that you can traverse. Um, in, in my book, I deal with thievery and forgery. I think when you're talking about the popularity of art crime, there is this wonderful nexus mm -hmm. of passion, beauty and big bucks mm. and that is a very very alluring package mm. Mm. if you add to it elements like the mafia and I know John mentioned yes it is true big art crimes are used by professional criminals as collateral for arms deals or drug thefts and in my book the mafia gets involved because they steal this painting which may or may not be a masterpiece by Renoir but 
Why was I spurred on to do that? Because one of these auctioneers was telling me about all the people that came into the New York auction house, that will be remain no, nameless, in the 80s with suitcases full of money. So it's also about money laundering. And the Mafia have a particular fascination with art and there is a Caravaggio huge altarpiece that was stolen in, um, from Sicily and was said to adorn the meetings between leading Mafia dons. I mean, how do you get past that fabulous image? But fundamentally, yes, I would say it is that intrigue of passion, glamour, desire, crime, and big dollars. Thank you. Well, just to add to that, um, there are a few other reasons. Um, one, there's very little violence. Uh, if you're writing about art crime, there's really not a lot of violence has happened. In Australia, I, I know of one person who's pulled out a gun on Peter Gant. Um, Peter Gant probably deserved to have a gun pulled on him. Um, <laughs> give me back my money. Um, and um, he's an, a very dodgy art dealer. Um, but, and there is also, um, back to Pamela's area, um, I don't regard my book as copaganda. Uh, there's no, the, the cops are kind of neutral. Sometimes they do a good job. Other times they do an absolutely appalling job. Even it's stuff that they should be doing, like distributing the information about what stolen art is, has been done. Um, so they're not even doing their basic job. It doesn't really require any inside knowledge to do that. Also, the other thing which is driving it more recently is um, colonial decolonialization, um, the amount of looted Southeast Asian and Indian artifacts that are in museums. Um, I've got a story about a village in India who basically was restoring a bit of their temple and realized it had been robbed. And by the time they had reported it to the police, about a month later, one of the stolen items turns up at the Australian National Gallery. Uh, it's since been returned, but yeah, that was how quick that was moved through the system of stolen antiquities. Uh, and as well, you know, in, in Australia, indigenous people having uh, not only forgeries, which there's a huge amount, but also issues over whether someone has got permission to sell those items or hasn't got permission to sell those items or was just meant to be displaying them, yeah. So there's all these cultural issues as well. Um, as well as there's almost no sex uh, or sexual violence. Oh. Oh, it's funny enough, I've got sex and violence in my book. Oh, yeah, I know, but I haven't, you know. Not in yours, no, Not I agree. <laughs> I've got sex and violence. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of violence. Little Gun play too. Um, yeah, I think one of my favourite stories one of my favourite stories about, um, and it often for me, whether, whether or not a warped sense of humour, but one of my favourite, thank you, this will be the last comment, um, was when um, Whitey Bulger, who was um, in the Boston mob, the poli police thought originally and probably rightly that they were involved in the initial theft at the Isabella Garden. Whitey Bulger, who was later murdered in jail, um, when they finally got him, what, after 20 years? Um, was that he, um, whenever he thought he might be in danger of being arrested, he would just go to the Boston National Gallery and steal a Rembrandt or a, just to have it in case so that he could do a deal. Um, now, I've just been given the 10-minute reminder, so it's now your turn. It's the time for questions. Vicky. <laughs> Oh, sorry, you've got to wait a minute, Mike. Vicky's a, my PhD student who's just done her work on the dancing Shiva that was stolen from the oh. National oh. Gallery. And as Vicky said, if they had wandered up the road to the new stuff, yeah, here, and looked at the front page of... Well, there was a textbook inside the Australia Times written in the 
antiquities and that, that particular one was in that book. Yeah. <laughs> so so if, they, yeah. if they'd just done the most preliminary research. Yeah. Okay, oh, they I wouldn't have Not it. so much a question but a statement. Thank you all. Um, but um, I just think it's great you, you, you're writing about this stuff because in the time that we've been researching it, it's really bubbling along now. So it's great to bring attention to it because you're right, there is that um, thought that, like you said, that people think, oh, it just belongs to rich people so it doesn't matter. Mm. We shouldn't care about it. But I think it's great and it shows, you know, Truth is stranger than fiction, yeah. so writing about the non-fiction stuff, all the colourful characters. Mm. So whether it's a fictional account or a non-fictional account, it's just great stuff. So thanks for contributing to that. Not so much a As question. indeed you have. Oh, okay, on. questions. Yes, um, red glasses. I'm Sorry, and then. Question. Oh. Yes. Thank you. I've actually written a book on art crime, but I've come from it from quite a different angle. And um, sorry, can I ask who, what your name is? I'm Chris Stewart. Um, Hi. From New Zealand. <laughs> but I, um, that's all right. But it's an art. It's it's an art crime that's set in, in Melbourne, where a body is placed under a um, a piece of graffiti, and now graffiti is becoming art, and graffiti is the uh, the art of the common people, and it's representative of iconography. And what fascinated me, and I just like your comment on it really, is that iconography um, changes with the with the times and the context. And what's interested for me was that how the police could look at the body under a particularly famous image um, and think of it in one way and the perpetrator in another and different people looking at a particular image of art have totally different understanding of its meaning. Yes. Have, have you... Mark, I think you're the what person. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, people have different values um, and I've got a few stories about graffiti writers in here. Um, people who believe that, you know, vandalism is a form of art and even ugly vandalism is their artistic expression. Uh, and yeah, and then you look at the Indian village where these are their gods. Um, or with indigenous art in Australia, this is sacred stuff sometimes. Um, and it should only be viewed in a particular way or in a particular context. Um, so yeah, people come to it with very different um, approaches. And well, uh, yeah, on the back to the sex thing, there was a statue in Melbourne which was castrated. Um, so yeah, someone well, different saw it viewpoints, off penis. Indeed. Yeah, different viewpoint. John, I'd, I'd add that the view about art changes all the time. So a great example of that for me is uh, one of I think the most beautiful sculptures in the world is Brancusi's Bird in Space. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen it, it's this beautiful mm. bronze... Soaring. Soaring shape. And in 1930, uh, or 33, Marcel Duchamp was holding uh, an exhibition in America and he invited Brancusi to send over Bird in Space. And there was an argument with the controller of customs <laughs> as to whether it was art or um, uh, metal, manufactured metal. If it was art, there was no tax on entry into the United States. If it was manufactured metal, it was, a, it was um, quite a high rate of tax. And so they were arguing it's art. And so um, uh, a whole bunch of experts were brought to the court oh, as gosh. to whether it was art or whether it was just <laughs> manufactured metal because it was abstract, right? And abstract, that was early days. And a, a number of experts said, this isn't art, this is garbage, you know, it's just metal. Um, and none of those experts are known today, mm. but of course the work is. So I think there's fashion, there's view, there's change. Um, you know, art is in the eye of the beholder sometimes. I'm sure you've been to a, a museum where you look at a work and you go, I don't get it. And then someone else is looking at it and saying, that's one of the most magnificent things I've ever seen. Mm. It's so subjective. Can I just add yeah. something to that? Is that it is also very much a matter of context. Mm. So not only personal interpretation, but where do you see this? Mm. And the imprimatur of a museum yes. or gallery, for instance, mentioning Marcel Duchamp, mm. is the famous urinal 
which he mounted as a sculpture and has been critiqued as such still ever since. Mm. So, yes. Hello, Hello. I'm Lorraine Peck. I'm a crime writer. And I'm interested in that missing Picasso, the one that was stolen from the art gallery, the National Art Gallery. Yeah. Oh, is in, it the New in South Victoria. Wales? The NGV. I was in Victoria, yeah. okay. I'm interested in what happened to that. And I'm also interested in which artists get forged most often. Ah, okay. Do you want me to repeat that question? Yes. Yeah, so could, the question. Could you not hear me? Okay. For the people at home, could you repeat the question? Oh, no need. No need. Okay. okay. I'm getting different information at the back. The, the NGV, um, the weeping woman was stolen. Two weeks later, it was returned in a locker at um, what is now Southern Cross Station, Flinders Street, uh, Spencer Street Station. Um, so it was all recovered, undamaged. Um, yeah, most of these Picassos are recovered. You know, like if you're going to recover a stolen painting, it really doesn't take a long period of time. Ob the thieves often get rid of it very quickly, or they really are just holding it for ransom or to make their political point. Now, the other question was about forgeries. Ah, now here it is. If you want to forge an artist, you want someone who's reasonably well known, preferably has a drug habit, so that they were selling art off the books, out of their agents, cataloging, straight from the studio to someone who would then give them cash. Um, so that they've got poor record keeping. So that's Brett, in Australia, that's Brett Whiteley and... Um, but there are object, the, the, the 101 of the masterclass, Beck, if you like, um, the masterclass is definitely held by two Englishmen, um, John Myatt and John Drew. They have... John Drew established a method of um, not only finding an excellent painter who became his forger, but then the masterclass in being able to usurp the detail, insert the details of that work into uh, the pro in, in its provenance, the provenance of the period. So, for instance, a GIA committee would be forged by John Myatt, and Drew, but Drew realised that to actually make it sell, to give it authenticity, he needed a rock solid provenance so he went to he was a donor for the, Na for the national library in london gave them lots of money when nobody give libraries money so he was given carte blanche to go in and go out when he wanted he went in and found a 1923 uh, very flimsy little catalog of uh, from an exhibition in a sale exhibition in switzerland um, where there were some geo committees he managed to locate more of that paper in an abbey in northern England, which he then became friends with the abbot and managed to steal. Then he used, he managed to find particular printing presses and a photography method that was identical to those used in the other works in that pamphlet. He then inserted the John Mayart Geo Committee into that pamphlet. And then the joke of it was, it went for sale in America and the, the buyer, said to the auction house, yes, I'll buy it, but I want someone to authenticate it, and they chose John Drew to do it. <laughs> so, John, so John Drew took them to the library, you know, the, the absolutely rock-solid base for any scholarship in art history in England, and said, now, let me see, let me see, let me see. It looks like one of his 1920 works. Let me see, let me see. Oh, look, here's a catalogue. This might be interesting. Voila. It's, but that's only, that is only the beginning. How there hasn't been a movie made of those two, I do not know. Now, we've run out of time, just about. Um, so it's my job to, the very, having had a lovely morning myself, um, to, to thank my panel, to thank Mark and Alexandra and John for a riveting, I mean, this is like grist to my mule to actually have these three sitting here and be able to drill them. And I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Now, you can get, lucky, all of you, you should get all three of them because they're really, they're very different. They're rock solid in terms of their, um, what I always look for in a book, I, wa I want to know that it's believable. I, wa I want to believe in these plots. 
And both John's book and, and Alexandra's book absolutely have that in spades. And John's is like um, the kind of pick-up Bible that you keep next to your bed, or if you me, you keep next to your bed thinking, now what was that one that happened in 1954 to do with those bronzes? So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>